I will decide Iran's relations under the question of the United States. Rouhani came in and oversold the nuclear deal. Their message to President Trump is, you can talk to the Turks, you can talk to the Saudis, you can talk to the Russians, anybody you want, but we are the only ones on the ground. Hi, I'm Paul Salem with the Middle East Institute and welcome to Vantage Point. I have the pleasure to have with me a, a good friend and senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, Mr. Alex Vitenka. Alex, uh, nice to have you. Uh, Alex uh, uh, runs sort of our Iran work here at the Middle East Institute. He's also an adjunct professor at the U.S. Air Force Special Ops Command. Uh, he's the author of a, uh, a recent book called Iran and Pakistan, Security, Diplomacy and American Influence out of I.B. Taurus. Uh, he writes and publishes with MEI, with Foreign Affairs, with Foreign Policy, The National Interest, CNN website, and others. Uh, he's a frequent commentator in the media and uh, briefing government officials uh, both here and around the world. Alex, it's nice to have you. I want to talk with you about two things. One is, how is Iran uh, dealing with the new Trump administration? How does it read it? How, what does it see as risks and opportunities? Mm -hmm. Uh, and secondly, uh, maybe talk a bit about uh, regional policy of Iran in the Middle East, if there's anything changing, and they have presence in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, and, uh, and end uh, with the upcoming Iranian election. So we have a lot of ground sure. to cover. And let's start with uh, Iran and the U.S. elections. How did they read it? How are they interpreting? What are they doing? Well, thanks, Paul. Um, if you go back about a year ago or so, I would have to say, in answer to that uh, question, that the Iranian regime overall, if you consider the main factions, were probably most excited about a Trump presidency. Really? For mm -hmm. one simple reason, and that is, he's a Republican, mm -hmm. he's a businessman, he's a transactional kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So they thought, here is a U.S. president who's not going to come in with an ideological agenda or a mm -hmm. wish list that he wants to sort of get from the Iranian in terms of concessions, mm -hmm. which they feared a Hillary Clinton presidency will, presidency will look Interesting. like. Interesting, yeah. So now we're almost two months into the Trump administration. What do they make of Mr. Trump in the White House? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the latest that's coming out of Tehran, and I would probably argue, let's not put, put too much emphasis on how hurt or not the Iranians are about this travel ban one of those countries that has been mm. on the travel ban being uh, Iran. That doesn't seem to be the headline. The headline is, what is President Trump really about in the Middle East? And mm -hmm. frankly, I think in a nutshell, what you can say is they don't know. They don't know either. They, they don't know either. Yeah. They, they are still trying to figure out. They're still hopeful. Mm -hmm. And that's the part I think is important. But too. what struck me about the Trump team, I mean, just uh, watching it from here, is that if there was one thing they all agreed on, right. it wasn't Russia because Trump seems to like Russia, as members of his team seem to not like Russia. Uh, they might disagree on trade, they might disagree as a yeah. Trump and his team. They all seem to agree on hostility to Iran, wanting to push back on Iran and contain Iran. And yet the nuclear deal stays. And so what are they making of it? Uh, and, and maybe what do you make of it in terms of policy? You know, I think you're absolutely right. I think the way they look at it is certainly the White House um, you know, if we go back to the days of mm -hmm. Michael Flynn, they looked at the national security team and they thought this is one anti-Iran team that President mm -hmm. Trump put together. So they were obviously cautious and if not fearful about that. But then they would look to the likes of General Mattis, mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense Mattis, uh, Rex Tillerson of the State Department, and they go, again, more like a traditional Republican mindset. That's mm -hmm. what they're hoping for. Despite the fact that someone like... Uh, Mr. Mattis today at Pentagon has a long history of being yes. very hawkish on the Iran yeah. issue. I mean, he's when he was asked repeatedly, what is the biggest he, threat? Yeah, he repeated. Three times yeah. he said, Iran, Iran, mm -hmm. Iran. So that, But nonetheless, I think the Iranians are looking at 
the new administration, they see three schools of thought. They see the president himself, transactional guy. Mm -hmm. He's looking for good deals. Can Iran offer him good deals that might actually incentivize him? Then they see the ideologues, probably see Stephen Bannon's and mm -hmm. St Sebastian Gorka's of this world, who came in, already made up their mind what they want to do with Iran, and mm -hmm. um, again, ideologically driven to a, to a large extent. And then you got the sort of classical geopolitical minds like Mattis and Tillerson and, and McMaster, McMaster and, and yeah. so forth. Who is going to dominate mm -hmm. the conversation? But I think your point is absolutely on the money when you say if there's one consensus mm -hmm. is that Iran is a bad actor as far as the United States is concerned in terms of mm -hmm. protecting U.S. interest in the, in the region. But at the same time, what I think they are um, also recognizing is President Trump's not going to go after them on the nuclear deal. What President Trump is going to do, and that's something we're going to talk about mm -hmm. since it's one of your points, is to push back against what Iran is doing mm -hmm. in the region. We'll get to that, indeed. Uh, uh, we talked a little bit about, in a sense, the different groups within the Trump administration. Obviously, there's groups or factions right. you know, within the Iranian government, let alone the people, some of which are affected by the ban, which is a different right. issue. But have you detected different tone or different sort of attitude from, let's say, Rouhani and Zarif on one side, maybe, and, you know, the hardliners, Qasem Soleimani, the supreme leader himself. Uh, uh, in terms of this new American administration, are they sort of on the same general page, or are they sending slightly different signals? You know, overall, I would say um, on the question of the United States, simply because the Iranian supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has made it one of his sort of taboo issues. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's one of his few red lines, if you will. Mm -hmm. I will decide Iran's relations on the question of the United States. Mm -hmm. And when he comes out and says that so forcefully and as, as publicly as he does, mm -hmm. it takes away sort of... So it's one. ...space from yeah. Rouhani and Zarif. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sort of step on his toes. Mm -hmm. So they're very careful. Um, Khamenei hasn't come out and said, we don't want to deal with Trump. Mm -hmm. Instead, he turns the argument around and says, we cut a deal with the United States over the nuclear issue in July of 2015. You were supposed to lift all the sanctions and everything was supposed to be fixed in Iran. Mm. Guess what? The sanctions are still, some of them at least, are in place and so forth, which I think is obviously a total mis misrepresentation mm -hmm. of what the nuclear deal was supposed to do. The nuclear deal on the promises it made on fixing the Iranian economy, i.e. lifting international sanctions, has delivered. Mm -hmm. That's why Iran's That's oil the production... International that's sanctions. the international yeah. side. But for the Iranian regime to come out, it doesn't matter if you're a moderate or hardliner, to come out and say everything hasn't been fixed overnight, mm -hmm. well, that's not the U.S.'s fault. There are a lot of issues that Iran needs to fix at home, mm -hmm. and you can't blame everything that's going wrong in the Iranian economy mm -hmm. on this administration or the previous administration. Well, let me then go to sort of a policy question, which is, as you said, uh, the U.S. interpretation of this administration emphasizes very much, you know, the the negative impact that Iran is having in the region. They right. have troops effectively in Syria uh, and proxies and so on, and in Iraq and in Lebanon, and support for the Houthis, maybe not as much as in, in Iraq and Syria, but definite support in terms of missile systems and financial and political uh, to yeah. the Houthis uh, on the Red Sea and on the southern, uh, southern part of, of Saudi Arabia. So it's quite an extensive and active presence uh, run-ins with the U.S. Navy, with the Saudi Navy, with the right. UAE Navy, which uh, all of which we're following. Uh, in the context of, you know, developments, a new U.S. administration, new positions and so on, uh, do you see any changes uh, or any new thinking or any difference in how Iran looks at the risks of their interventions right. in, Iran, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Lebanon? Or is it sort of you know, business as usual in those interventions. Right. You know, Paul, I would put it this way. I would say within the sort of foreign policy establishment in Iran, there is debate. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. But is that debate worth us paying too much attention to? Uh, is it really called, I mean, the decisions are called by few individuals mm -hmm. like Supreme Leader Khamenei, Qasem Soleimani, and other top generals in IOGC. I think the debate on that will continue. But we can look at it from a different perspective. There are reports that, for instance, the IRGC, the Revolution Guards Navy in the Persian mm -hmm. Gulf, is not as provocative today as it was a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Are they perhaps fearful that President Trump will decide to sort of 
show some muscle mm -hmm. and go after them. They don't want that. They're not going to invite military confrontation mm -hmm. in the United States because they know, frankly, they will be on the losing end of that. Mm -hmm. um, but elsewhere, we don't see that kind of caution. I mean, just today, 17th of March, last night, we hear the Israelis went after Shia militias and Hezbollah fighters on the mm -hmm. Golan. Mm -hmm. What is Iran doing massing up troops on the Golan Heights? That's not a sign of moderation. Mm -hmm. If anything, that's a sign of provocation, which takes me to a point that I think a lot of people in Tehran, in the regime circles, still believe, which is that if Iran is not a kingmaker in the, re in the region, in the many conflicts mm -hmm. that the region is experiencing, certainly is a key player. Mm -hmm. Take Syria. So what are we hearing from the Iranian uh, media all the time? We have 30,000 troops on the ground. We are 30,000. We're a yeah, player. major player. We're yeah. a player. You can't, you cannot come and mm -hmm. fix Syria without taking us into account. So uh, in other words, their message to P President Trump is, you can talk to the Turks, you can talk to the Saudis, mm -hmm. you can talk to the Russians, anybody you want, but we are the only ones on the ground who can actually move things around. So mm -hmm. I don't know how much of that is going to be making impressions if, in the mean, White House. In parentheses, I mean, since in Syria, the discussion of Raqqa and what might be happening with Raqqa in right. the next few months, and there's so many players, the Americans have just put more sort of uh, fighters right. and more soldiers on the ground. The Russians are close by, the Turks are there, the Assad regime is there. The Iranian militias and proxies in Hezbollah are not too far away either. Right. Uh, do you have any sort of uh, uh, understanding of, given all of these players, how this main movement in Syria, which is sort of one of the main issues that is going to be coming up the next few months, how that might play out? I think the Iranians today are a bit less fearful than mm. were the case a few months ago. A few months ago, there was a genuine fear in Tehran that Russia and Turkey perhaps with others, we're going to cut some sort of a deal, mm -hmm. sidelining the Iranians. Now they feel that the Turks don't actually have that many great options, mm -hmm. which in turn, despite the fact that we're experiencing much bad blood today between Iran and Turkey, mm -hmm. the Iranians are leaving the door open to the Turks. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a sense that the Gulf Arab states are pulling away from Syria seriously that they're going to focus on Yemen, mm -hmm. that whatever happens in terms of a political settlement, which is what most people agree needs to take place in Syria, it will take um, place with the usual suspects at the table. Mm -hmm. Iran will be one of them, the other is obviously Turkey, Russia, mm -hmm. United mm -hmm. States, and so forth. So I think, frankly, when you look at Iran's regional behavior, mm -hmm. the dominant school of thought that's in the driver's seat are the ones who believe you've got to be underground, you've mm -hmm. got to show strength and that's the only way you're going to and be then respected talk. then talk yeah. talk yeah. from a position of strength let's move on to the elections uh, yeah. as we saw elections are very easy to predict as we saw in the u.s and it's all well known yeah. beforehand <laughs> so i will ask you uh, about the iranian elections obviously president rouhani is running for a second term right uh, what is the electoral scene as best you can you know examine it uh, from from abroad what does it look like what are Rouhani's strong points and weak points? Who are his main right. competitors? What do you expect and what might it mean? I mean, look, it, it really comes down to what you decide to use as a barometer to sort of measure mm. his success. If success is that he avoided war and got a nuclear deal, certainly he's been a successful. Mm. But if your success is about did he, you know, open up Iran from the sort of political repression that the country's under at home, mm -hmm. certainly not. Uh, so, you know, six years or so after the Iranian opposition leaders were put under house arrest, they're still under house mm -hmm. arrest. Rouhani never calls himself a reformist. Mm -hmm. Rouhani makes it very clear that it is the supreme leader who calls the shots. Rouhani wants to be someone who can advise the supreme leader about the big trajectory of where Iran mm -hmm. is going at home and in the region, but he's certainly not going to challenge the supreme leader. Mm -hmm. um, now. The other thing is mismanagement of popular expectations. Mm -hmm. Rouhani came in and oversold the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. That it would that, solve everything. That was, yeah. you know, Iran would turn around and become Japan of, of West Asia overnight. Mm -hmm. Now, a, any economist will tell you there's some serious structural issues that mm -hmm. need to be fixed. They can be fixed by one president in four years, uh, nor are the Iranians at all in agreement about where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Take the issue of foreign investment which is you know, the one thing that Rouhani seems to spend most of his time trying to figure out. Why does he care about these major multi-billion dollar investments? Because he feels if he signs you know, a X amount of billions of dollars with Japanese company or European company, that means political capital in an important country mm -hmm. that can mm -hmm. then help Iran, should Iran be isolated again. That's his, 
that's his sort of blueprint. Mm -hmm. the trouble with that is those major foreign policy deals, some of which have been struck, are not producing jobs. Mm -hmm. So you have today in Iranian society something like 700,000 new jobs need to be created. They're producing about half of that in terms mm -hmm. of new That's jobs. That's per year? That's per year. Yeah. Unemployment officially about 12%. Mm -hmm. but most people tell you underemployment is a bigger problem. I think when we see some statistics showing or some data showing that Ahmadinejad would actually be able to still get 15, 20% of the vote, given what Ahmadinejad did to Iran mm -hmm. when he was president, that's quite that telling. That shows discontent. That shows yeah. a lot of people yeah. in Iranian society today looking at Rouhani saying, great that you got a nuclear deal. We're disappointed you're not really pushing ahead with political mm. reform of any kind. And by the way, the economy is really only working in certain mm -hmm. sectors, but the trickle down is not happening. Well, what's the scene like electorally? Main competitors, uh, what can you tell our audience about? Sure. What is it looking like? So the reformists in Iran are pretty much dead. Mm -hmm. And that's why someone like Hassan Rouhani, who, as I said, never calls himself a reformist, is their candidate. Because mm, they don't have it. They candidate. don't have anybody else. Yeah. They don't have the stamina or the capacity to come up with someone like a Mohammad Khatami. Mm -hmm. Their best hope is this fellow called Hassan Rouhani, mm -hmm. who calls himself a, a centrist. Uh, on the other side, you got a list of hardliners who are all attacking Rouhani basically on the same issues. Mm -hmm. You sold out on a nuclear deal. The economy is not working and outlandish charges that, for instance, his government is inf infiltrated by Western intelligence mm -hmm. services. I mean, mm -hmm. suggestions that of, yeah. cannot fake be news, fake news, fake Iranian news. style, Iranian style. <laughs> fake news, Iranian style. Yeah. Um, and they're divided. I they're mean, divided. The, the ones up, so that might be an and advantage even for him as well. Uh, and they're yeah. even divided on the, on the issue of strategy against yeah. Rouhani. Should they run multiple candidates? Mm -hmm. Would they gain a higher percentage of the vote that way and make sure Rouhani doesn't reach the 50%? Mm -hmm. Or should they have one candidate? If it, they're going to lean towards one candidate, they're going to struggle because the people that we're seeing put out there, people like the Tehran mayor, um, uh, Mohammad Qalibov, people like Mohsen Rezaei, former IRGC commander, mm -hmm. Uh, people like the former head of the Iranian national television, uh, Ezzatullah Zarami, these are not big names. They're big names in terms of being known, mm -hmm. but they don't mobilize support. Mm, they don't have ideas. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and, and one other way, Paul, of looking at this question and answering what you asked me is to look at what would the Iranian supreme leader Khamenei want? Well, that's what I wanted to ask you, maybe sort of as an ending question. Does the supreme leader want Rouhani to be president? And does President Rouhani want to be the supreme leader? Mm -hmm. In the sense that if he gets a second term, if you know the supreme leader passes away, he'll be in a good position. Well, he'll be president when that happens. Does he have that ambition? But let's start with what do you think the supreme yeah. leader wants in this election? Does he want continuity or, or change? History shows us that the supreme leader prefers mm -hmm. continuity. Mm -hmm. This is the Islamic Republic of Iran that likes to say it has many elections. Mm -hmm. That's the Republican side of the system. But those elections have to be very tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what usually happens. I think what Mahmoud Ahmadinejad did to Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, in his second term, when he started pushing back mm -hmm. against some of mm -hmm. the wishes of Khamenei, that left a very bad taste in Khamenei's mouth. So he looks at someone like Hassan Rouhani and he says there are certain things that he says and people that he has around him that I don't like or not mm. comfortable with. But I still know who this mm. guy is. And he trusts him. And I trust him. Yeah. And I know he's not going to be pushing his luck too much, mm -hmm. unlike what Ahmadinejad did. So I think he's going to stay with, uh, with Rouhani. He, because in a sense, what he gets is the best of both worlds. Rouhani can be the smiling mullah looking to the world and mm. attracting investment and saying we, Iran is a normal country. and we can negotiate and cut deals with everyone. And then you got the real players in the region, the generals from the Revolutionary Guards who don't answer to Rouhani, mm -hmm. who answer straight to Khamenei, and they're doing their thing. So you basically have two worlds serving, uh, both worlds being served mm -hmm. uh, by having this sort of division of, of labor if you're Khamenei. And to your point about could Rouhani be the next Supreme mm -hmm. Leader of Iran, on paper, why not? He's older than what Khamenei was back in 1989. Yeah, he was young when he was became. a 49-year-old yeah. much ahead. He wasn't even a, mm. a senior cleric. Um, Rouhani has been part and parcel of the system. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in this town, 
assume that Rouhani has more enemies than he probably does. Mm -hmm. He's much more of a bridge builder, a compromiser, if you will. And the reason why he hasn't gone out for the last four years and turned himself into a reformist hero, try and become a Muhammad Khatami, mm -hmm. is for one simple reason. He wants to tap into the right as well. Mm -hmm. He wants to bring some of the soft right-wingers into the bigger Rouhani camp. And probably because he thinks, and he has good reasons to think, he could be a real contender. Should the Iranian Supreme Leader, who will turn 78 mm -hmm. this June, who is one of the last standing from that first generation of revolutionaries that toppled the Shah back mm -hmm. in 1979, mm -hmm. should he depart the political scene, Rouhani would be in a very strong position to put himself forward. Interesting. Um, and that would be, that poll would be far more consequential mm -hmm. for the future of the Islamic Republic than the 19th of May presidential elections, which is really, mm -hmm. you know, compared to the succession issue for Supreme Leader, the presidential yeah, elections small, is, a, is a side uh, show. Small, small show. It's a side show. Well, that's fascinating discussion, Alex. Thanks for your, your time and your insights. And uh, this is a conversation that will continue. And we'll see if there are any electoral surprises in the upcoming elections. Uh, thank you for watching. This is Alex Vitenka, Senior Fellow at the Middle East Institute, and myself, Paul Salem with Vantage Point, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.